Hi, everyone. I am Jay Watson with Emory Brain Health, and I am joined today by pandemic expert Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Executive Associate Dean of Emory University School of Medicine at Grady Health System and Professor of Medicine, Global Health and Epidemiology. Dr. Del Rio, thank you so much for joining us once again this week. Jay, happy to be with you. Uh, I wanted to start by going over um, the cases in Georgia. Um, as of right now, before today's posting, we have 10,204 cases, 2,089 hospitalized, and 370 deaths. With that in mind, we're going to begin with um, several pages of questions that came in in advance of this Facebook Live right now. And we're going to begin uh, with a big one, which is, are we flattening the curve in Georgia? And is what we are doing working? I think we're beginning to flatten the curve here in Atlanta because the stay at home was implemented by the mayor. Uh, this Monday would have been two weeks, and that's exactly when you begin to see a flattening of the curve. And I think across hospitals in Metro Atlanta, we're beginning to see a, a, a flattening of the number of admissions, and that I think is a result of flattening of the curve. I'm not yet sure we're seeing a flattening of the curve in Georgia, but it's going to be a little too early. Uh, remember, the, the governor did not implement that until uh, a few days ago. So I think it's going to take a little time for us to see the difference. But what we're doing right now is the right thing. I think we're in the right path here in Georgia. I'm confident that the measures being taken are important, but it's going to be also important that every citizen does their part. This is really up to us. It's not just up to the government. Each one of us has a role to play in stopping the transmission of this virus. What is the latest, latest estimate of how many people have been infected for each confirmed case? Well, that, that varies and depends on the amount of testing you're doing. It's anywhere between five and 10 times the number of reported cases. And as the U.S. is scaling up testing significantly, a lot of the diagnoses are already cases that have been infected. So, and the number of, of the sort of the, the difference decreases, but at some point in time we were about at about a tenfold difference. Right now, mm -hmm. I think we're probably more in the in three to five fold difference. So this person had a follow up question that says if there are 10 cases for each confirmed case, that would mean there are 4,500,000 people in the US who got it. However, there are 330 million Americans. This means 325 million still haven't gotten it. And that seems daunting and that this is far from over. Please share your thoughts on this. I think that's true. I think that is exactly one of the concerns that we all have. And there have been some models suggesting that as much as, as a third of the U.S. population may get infected. So yeah, that we're talking about 100 million people. So, you know, if we're at 4 million, we still have even a, a 94 million to go, right, to get to 100 million. So, again, if you, if, you, if you stop transmission at some point in time, the virus goes away, right? Because simply, you know, it's key to stopping, it's key to ending transmission is doing that. If you, if you have no, the virus has nowhere to go, it just goes away. So I think the more we can, that's, the, that's what we call decreasing the R-naught. If we can bring the R-naught below one, if one infected individual leads, leads to less than one other infected individual, the disease will go away. We can stop the disease without having a vaccine if we do that. Are the estimates of one to 240,000 Americans um, going to be lower now that we're doing what we're doing? They are, and they're being lowered and in fact, the latest I've seen is, is talking more in the neighborhood of 60,000 Americans dying. But I still want to recall, remind you, 60,000 people dying is a lot of people dying. Yeah. Governor Kemp has extended the shelter in place until the end of April. What do you think of this? I think it's a great move. I'm very, very enthusiastic about that. I think he's listening to public health. I think he's listening to Dr. Toomey, and I think he's doing the right things. Governor Kemp also banned short-term vacation rentals for the month. A lot of us are trying to get to less heavily populated areas. Why is that a bad thing? Well, you know, again, uh, you, we are trying to get to less populated areas, but you also want to be sure that if I'm coming from Atlanta and I may be infected, and we can talk later about this asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission, that one person going to a community can spark an outbreak in that community, in that less populated community. Hi there. I'm wondering if after I've recovered from COVID-19, is it okay to socialize with a friend? You know, there's a lot of questions about immunity, but my answer to that is probably yes. Once you've recovered, you, you're no longer infectious or you're no longer capable of getting infected. 
at least in the, at least in the short time. Dr. Del Rio, I've gotten this question, I think, every week we've talked, and we haven't gotten around to it. So this person asked, I know we have to wash our hands with soap for 20 seconds. Does it matter if the water is hot or cold? It doesn't matter. Just wash your hands. Okay. Can I drive around with the windows rolled down in my car? I know we had this, I believe, maybe the first that's, week. That's totally fine. Okay. I read a study out of Belgium that says that six feet isn't far enough away from each other when exercising outdoors. It says the person behind you can get caught in the slipstream of droplets that you're expelling. It says you should stay more like 12 to 15 feet away. Is yeah, this was, true? That was a really interesting uh, study. I, I think it may be true. I mean, I would say that it may be true, but I was talking to a friend of mine who says, you know, I run with, with a running buddy and we run parallel to each other. So we're together advancing at the same time. We're not one in front of the other, but we're you know, at, the, at the same, but we're still six feet a, apart from each other, but we're running together. That may be another strategy. I feel like hydroxychloroquine is a great option. So why aren't we using it more? I hear it can totally save people. Well, again, we don't make medical decisions on, on I feel, and I hear medical decisions, giving drugs to people, especially drugs that potentially have serious side effects are giving on the basis of clinical trials. And we are conducting right now the clinical trials and some of the clinical trials around hydroxychloroquine that are going to give us the answer. But you know, you, the same way you wouldn't treat, you wouldn't treat somebody with cancer saying, I hear that, you know, X drug works. I feel like we should give it to people. You, you base it on evidence, and I think we need to develop the evidence that that comes from doing research. And it's unfortunate, research takes time, but we want to do the right thing. Right. Uh, Dr. Del Rio, this one just came in. It said, Dr. Del Rio, how are you feeling? I'm feeling fine. I'm feeling tired, but I'm feeling fine. I just, I just uh, feel we're in a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a different world right now. It's a very, it's almost like a twilight zone. It's a, it's a bit of a, of a very different environment, of a different uh, world we never, I mean, I just think about the world we lived in two months ago to where the world we live in today, right? And it's a very different world, okay. but we, we have to take care of ourselves and we, we're gonna be out of this. We just, need to, we just need to hunker down and do what we need to do and we'll get out of this. Talk about the things we took for granted, right? Yeah. I saw somebody I mean, saying we were going from standard time and we didn't realize when we switched the clocks, we were actually going to the twilight zone. Exactly, that's exactly yeah. right. Um, is it true the federal stockpile is depleted? And if so, what does that mean for our local hospitals? Uh, I, I don't think the federal stockpile is depleted. I think they have actually started to release things from the federal stockpile. They're going to different places, but they also are buying more things. So I think it's, uh, again, we have an unprecedented need for the things in the federal stockpile. So it's not just a matter of releasing, it's a matter of, of sort of supply chain, right? You need to continue having things come mm -hmm. there, and they are. Is there concern about long-term lung damage in mild cases of COVID-19? In general, no, but again, a lot of things that I've read about people with lung damage are people that have pre-existing lung conditions. So if you have chronic lung disease, if you're a smoker and you get an infection, you may have you know, residual scarring and residual effects, but that's with this virus or with any other virus. The bottom line, if you smoke, if you, you have problems with your lungs, you're, you're pretty supposed to have damage from other viruses, not just from this one. It's finally coming out that African-Americans are hit much harder by this virus, and it scares me this wasn't reported before. Why are more, more African-Americans dying from COVID-19? Well, that's a really important and interesting question, and there could be many reasons for that. Some of them biological, some of them uh, uh, environmental, some of them uh, just societal, right? First of all, this is not the only disease for which there are racial disparities in this country. There are enormous racial disparities in, in almost any disease that we look at. And I think as a country, we need to start thinking about addressing racial disparities and start yeah. just talking about it and really doing something about it. Uh, we know there are higher, there's higher poverty, there's higher uh, number of people living in, in, under one roof in, in, among minorities, not only African-Americans, but also Latinos. We know that uh, they have a higher incidence of diabetes and hypertension and obesity. So all those, all those diseases combined may actually lead to more disease and also more, uh, more risk from the disease. And again, that is, the, uh, that is a reality and we just have to, to then deal with it. And we really, as a country, I think we need to do a better job of thinking about racial and ethnic disparities. 
My question is about the upcoming election just postponed to June 9th. The new equipment requires us to touch six common pieces of equipment, touch screens and ballot access cards, for example. Wouldn't paper ballots be safer? There may be, but, you know, take your Purell. And after you touch something, I, you know, you go to the grocery store and you touch the keypad for your enter your pin. So just take a bottle of, of something to clean your hands after you do the touching and that's it. Can one have it and have several symptoms but no fever? Yes, at presentation, you may not have fever, but eventually we're seeing most people getting some degree of fever. If you or your child have been truly quarantined for over three weeks and so has a family member or friend in a separate household, is it safe to visit on Easter? No, it probably is. It probably is. But again, you need to be sure that they're truly have been quarantined and they're not in touch with each other. When do they expect the COVID-19 antibody test to be available? Uh, there's one already available and there's a couple more in development and in approval process. I suspect they'll be available in the next several weeks. If we are elderly with comorbidities, are we going to have to shelter until a vaccine is developed? Again, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I hope not. I mean, I think that what we want to do is hopefully, again, if we can decrease transmission, things are going to be much better, right? But we have to decrease transmission. Mm -hmm. How effective are homemade masks, really? You know, again, home, let's talk about masks. There's several types of masks. They're medical masks. And in the hospital, we have this one that we call a surgical mask. And a surgical mask is typically what the surgeon uses. And, you know, they're put like this. And this is a surgical mask. And again, it's got to cover your nose. And this mask is typically used for the surgeon to prevent things in my mouth to go through the mask into the patient. Then there is this kind of mask, which is called an N95 mask. And an N95 mask is a mask that prevents things from the outside to come in inside. So this is what I use when I go see a patient that has an infection like, like COVID. And then there's this kind of mask that are called the a cloth mask. This is the ones that you will be making at home, right? And right. This, and this mask are also good to prevent things from going from, from my mouth to the outside. So the reason to wear a mask in public is not to protect me, it's actually to protect others. If everybody uses it, you're protecting others. And what it does, the reason to wear a mask in public is asymptomatic transmission. So mm -hmm. you may, we have learned now that people start transmitting the disease 24 to 48 hours before they develop symptoms. They start transmitting the virus 24 to 48 hours before. So I could be in the grocery store. I look fine. I feel fine. But I'm there. I'm talking to the cashier or talking to you. And, and I could be then transmitting the disease. And the idea of wearing a mask is it, it, my transmission decreases. And we know from study, a recent study published by researchers at Yale University, that if everybody wore masks in the street, we will cut transmission in, at a population level by about 10 to 20%. So I think it's, it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. It for sure is. Uh, what is the surge in Georgia expected to look like? And does the state's contingency planning include the building of field hospitals? Well, we, we expect the surge to hit somewhere uh, next week. And we think it's going to look like, uh, you know, a lot of patients coming to hospitals. And yes, uh, the, the state is building field hospitals and is building field ICUs and is really getting ready for that. And again, the strategy has been and it's always and it will continue to be let's prepare for the worst and hope for the best if we have extra mm -hmm. capacity that is not used that's actually really good what would you guess would be our new normal while a vaccine is being tested for the next 18 months restricted travel continued physical distancing schools i know that's a big question you know it's a really big question a lot of us are yeah. thinking about that i think that it's going to look uh, probably a lot of it is going to depend on how much we can do testing. Because at some point in time, I would envision, for example, at a university, let's say Emory. Well, you know, you can say we'll do serological testing of students and of people coming in in the fall. And, you know, you may find a bunch of students who are already tested positive, so they already had it. And then you have a bunch of students that haven't tested positive. So maybe those that haven't tested positive come to class wearing a mask, while those that are positive are not required to wear a mask. Maybe some professors, if I'm a 65 year old professor who has diabetes and hypertension and haven't had the disease, maybe I continue teaching uh, through distance learning like Zoom, 
but a professor in her for in their 40s who already had the disease can come and teach a class. So I think it's going to be mm -hmm. very, it's going to look different, but it's not going to be like the end of the world. It'll be a new normal. It'll be a new normal. What are your thoughts on the long-term mental effects of our, on our healthcare workers and first responders who are on the front lines? PTSD and other longer-term effects are concerning for those who are sacrificing so much for us right now. Uh, we're all very concerned about mental health effects, and I think it's something that we are working hard. Our, our uh, chief psychologist, uh, Dr. Nadine Keslow here at Grady, uh, together with a, with a group of, of psychologists and psychiatrists in the Department of, of Psychiatry at Emory, have developed something called uh, uh, Caring Communities for COVID-19 Care uh, Givers. That is really a way to try to talk to people and to do the kinds of things we need to do to address the mental health concerns. It's something very important and something that we have to be doing and that we really need to put front and center. We need to think not only about physical health, but also about mental health. Absolutely. I have heard a lot lately saying if you take vitamins to ramp up your immune system, it might cause the virus to be worse on you. Is that true? I don't think it does either. Okay. Uh, from, a fu from a funeral home perspective, if a deceased body that is infected by COVID-19, can it still be transmitted? And how long in and on the body after the host has died would the virus live? I so know, there's, yeah. there's, there's some literature about, about this. And the recommendations is that, you know, essentially a dead body in a respiratory virus is not going to transmit because you're not going to have the secret, the, the, you know, the breath and other things coming out. And in funeral homes, they're going to use gloves and they're going to use a mask and that's going to be fine. There's no risk of transmission, really. What about the recent report of COVID in cats? Is this something to be worried about? You know, cats have always had coronavirus. They, coronavirus is like animals, like cats. Uh, I could envision a COVID infecting a cat. That was a case of the of the of the Bronx Zoo tiger that got infected. I wonder who put yeah. the wonder who put the swab up the tiger's nose. I've really been, <laughs> been kind of thinking about that one, but that's another story. But I think it's unlikely that that's going to be a problem. Should we be wearing glasses to protect our eyes? As I've heard that it may be possible to contract it via the eyes. You know, in healthcare, when we're taking care of people with the disease that are coughing and, and, and emitting secretions, we wear goggles or a face shield. I don't think you need to do that in public. Again, remember that the reason to mask yourself in public is to protect others from you. Right. If there is seasonality, would longer quarantine make the next season worse? You know, hopefully by the next season, we'll have a vaccine. So I, I tell people, let's not worry about the next season. Let's worry about this season. Let's get over this 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 battle first and then worry about the next one. I've heard one of the reasons younger people are dying in the U.S. is because of vaping and their lungs are already damaged. Have you heard this? I've heard that theory, but I think it needs to be proven. But, but I've heard that theory. There's also issues of obesity and other factors that need to be taken into consideration. I've been home for four weeks. I've not made any store visits and have not been near anyone. I sanitize my groceries and deliveries. Have I removed my chances for becoming infected with COVID-19? Thanks, Carlos. It's always great to see you. What are your thoughts on reports the BCG vaccine received after birth may offer some protection against COVID-19? It's, it's an interesting report, and we actually here at Emory are going to start a study looking at that. I think it's a really fascinating story, the one behind BCG, and I don't have more to what say. Is other. B, what is BCG, Dr. So BCG, it's a, BCG is a vaccine. is the most commonly used vaccine globally that actually... Uh, its, it's use is given in infants to prevent them from developing severe tuberculosis, a meningeal tuberculosis, disseminated tuberculosis. We have not been using it in the United States routinely and many other high income countries because we don't have enough tuberculosis. But in poor countries and developing countries, it continues to be used. And in fact, as I said, is the most commonly used vaccine globally. And there is some, some uh, data out there suggesting that maybe it produces some degree of protection and that's why we're not seeing as many cases in africa and in other countries where there's a lot of bcg vaccination so that's being looked at it's an interesting observation but it needs to be corroborated by by studies if you develop a fever how high should you let it get before treating it well you know you're gonna have a fever go to 103 104 you're just gonna feel uncomfortable right so i i think a fever is a, is a, is a way our body tells us there's an illness there's a disease, there's a disease. But I don't think, you know, you don't want a fever to be in a, in a way that it's, it's, it's too uncomfortable and you feel terrible. You know, I think if you start having a fever of, of about 100, 
one hundred and two, you ought to take something for the fever. But again, you need to find out why you're having a fever. Right. A recent study in Germany proposes that only 6% of the infected people are being reported. Does that mean millions have been infected and have recovered with minimal symptoms? You know, it's, it's one of the most uh, interesting questions that are out there. And I, in fact, a lot of the studies that CDC and others are planning doing serological studies and seroservice are precisely to try to find that. We really don't know the extent of people that have been infected. There's so much asymptomatic infection or my, mildly symptomatic infection. You know, I will tell you, I know, I know personally about a, a person in their, in their 30s who, you know, a week ago had a temp, one time had a fever. That's it. No other symptoms. And yet the person, you know, tested positive. And so there may be many people like that who tested, who would have, have tested positive had they been tested, right? So yes, at mm -hmm. some point in time, serological studies is going to tell us a true it's going to tell us the true denominator. And when we know the true denominator, we may find out that there's not 10,000 people infected in Georgia, but 100,000 people infected in Georgia. And therefore, the mortality is going to be much lower than we actually think it is. Do you think that universities will be reopening in the fall? I'm pretty confident that they will. In the hospital, we've been discharging PUI COVID patient, positive patients back to their homes to self-quarantine when they often do not have adequate places to do so and will likely expose their families. Is there any possibility of opening up dorms and hotels as potential places for these people to quarantine in Atlanta? Yes, people are looking at that because that is actually an important point. If somebody is discharged uh, and they're still uh, infected and they're still trans potentially transmitting, uh, well, they should not be at home with others that could could get infected. But again, I remind you of two things. CDC has told us that seven days after symptoms, when they have resolved, you're not infectious anymore. So if somebody has been in the hospital for a week, they're probably fine going home. Should I start wearing a mask around my home if I have a fever and haven't received a positive diagnosis yet? Yes. Is there any news to share on the vaccine trial that started recently or new treatments for COVID-19? You know, the news is that the vaccine trials are progressing. We have enrolled people, they're progressing, but you know, uh, it's, a, it's a slow process, but it's coming along. I would say that the vaccine trials are underway and people are enrolling. Uh, and same thing with treatment. I think with one of the trials that we're involved here at Emory, the, uh, one of the remdesivir trials we're involved here at Emory, that trial probably will be fully enrolled uh, next week. And nationally, there's 54 centers that are enrolling. And it is very, very likely that by, uh, that in a couple of weeks or maybe sometime in late May, we will have at least some, some initial uh, results saying, does it work or does it, does it not work? How long should you quarantine after having symptoms? Some say 72 hours with no fever, others up to 21 days. So the recommendation is if you have the disease, you should isolate yourself and you can come off isolation for, and they're said 70, 72 hours without symptoms. So if you're still having fever or you're still having not feeling well, that doesn't count. Well, from the moment you're actually feeling totally fine, count 72 hours. Or count seven days after your symptoms resolve, whatever is longer. Do you think that all people should eventually get a COVID antibody test? Well, you know, when, when it's available, I certainly think that some people are, are really important that they get a COVID antibody test. And those will be healthcare workers, those will be, you know, people that are exposed to a lot of people like teachers and, and, and others. I think if you are, you know, somebody that, you know, that is not exposed to a lot of people, you probably don't need it, right? But if you're gonna be in environments where you're exposed to a lot of people, it probably is a good idea. When do you think coronavirus will peak in Georgia? Again, you know, it's a, it's, it's a guess, but sometime in, 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 in mid to late April, somewhere around the 20th of April, I think so. What is known about the sensitivity of the diagnostics being used currently? Point of care, Abbott versus others. And what does this mean for the epidemic in Georgia? So we don't know a lot because, again, we don't really know. I mean, many of them have not been tested against a gold standard. So, but we know that, you know, we clinicians talk about sensitivity and specificity to the test, meaning the ability to diagnose uh, some, someone. The laboratory people talk about sensitivity and specificity of the assay, of the test itself. And the sensitivity of the test is pretty good, but it depends on getting a good sample that you can actually run in the machine. And sometimes a lot of the problems that we're seeing is because they're simply poor samples. And if the sample is not good, the, the test is not going to work. 
Can you comment on the Politico article which stated that by December we will be going through this again? I can't comment because, you know, again, uh, I don't know if we're going to go through this again. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a guess. And I think if we go through what? it again, it will be very different because we'll have testing, we'll have other things that we currently don't have as much. What is the exit strategy from the shutdown? So I think the exit strategy is, number one, we need to start seeing cases come down. We need to see the cases really come down in a significant way. Number two, we need to scale up testing significantly so we can actually know who's infected and who's not. But more importantly, we can then identify people who are infected and very rapidly isolate them. So identification and isolation of cases and then contact tracing to find out those that the person has been exposed to and doing the same thing is going to be the strategy that we need. And if we have those things in place, I think the, the, the shutdown can start to be lifted. Is it safer to have 80 year old parents come stay with us if the three of us stay home or let them stay in their own home? They live 30 minutes away from me and I worry that if my mom gets it, my dad won't do a great job taking care of her. And if they both get it, then what? They keep wanting to shopping, but I've won the battle the past two weeks, but now I'm afraid they won't tell me if they need things. So tough to know what the right thing is to do. Thank you. It's so tough to know what the right thing to do is, but it may be better if truly nobody has gone out and there's no risk of exposure and we can keep them, you know, in a bit of, of social distancing within the house. Maybe they're better off staying with the family as opposed to being by themselves. I mean, I think they'll be more able to get things, you know, I, I don't know many 80 year olds who know, you know, how to get groceries delivery uh, done. You know, they still used to go to the grocery store, but maybe, you know, younger person may be more likely to do that. So it may be better for them to come over, provided that you have a space to do so. I know a lot of these questions have similarities, but we can see what people are very interested in today. This is this person asked, what will be the benchmark that will allow normal life, like kids attending school, restaurants open, gatherings like concerts? church, events resuming, what will be the benchmark? I, I want to see a decrease in the number of cases. I want to see that would be my first sign of return to normalcy. When we start seeing not patients coming to the emergency room, we start saying, where are the patients? Cases are coming down. We have more testing. We have more evidence of where cases are happening. I think that will allow us to return to normalcy. When stay-at-home order is lifted, will we still have to wear a mask and practice the six-foot rule? If yes, for how long? You know, I don't know, but I think it's going to be a different world. It may be that you don't need to practice the six feet rule everywhere, but it may be that if you, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm going to run this fall and attend a, you know, a major uh, mega church event, or I'm not sure I want to go to a big, you know, sports event. I love going to baseball, but is that the right thing to do when we start lifting this? I'm not sure. I think there's a lot, a lot of un unknowns at this point in time, and I don't think anybody has the right answers. And I think a lot of what's going to happen is we're going to test something, do it. It didn't work. We'll have to go back, right? This is going to be mm -hmm. a, a, sort of a, te a, a test and treat approach. I don't, think we, I don't think anybody knows the right answer. In the absence of a vaccine, it's very hard to know the right answer. Uh, I've heard a lot of people worrying that we're going to do away with the handshake. What do you think of that? You know, I've heard that too. Um, I hope we don't, but I've heard that too. Maybe we, we shake hands and then we, we, we purel each other, right? It'll be the handshake and purel approach. <laughs> um, this is from a healthcare worker, Dr. Del Rio. When do you think healthcare workers will be able to be tested? Going in daily and going back home to our families can be so scary. It is scary. And I think, again, uh, I want to thank healthcare workers for what they're doing and being in the front lines. This is not only are we... Uh, providing care, but people are not only providing care, they're doing it with gusto and they're doing it exposing themselves and potentially even taking uh, infection back to their whole home. So again, uh, real heroes. And it's not just people in health. It's also, I think about, you know, the people working in, in, in grocery stores and in delivery and in other places. Uh, they're doing the job that is keeping things going. And I think that's really uh, remarkable and something we all need to be happy about. But the uh, the testing really is going to be depending on what happens. I think a lot of scaling up testing is happening. Uh, you know, here in Georgia, CVS is going to start doing the, the Abbott rapid test pretty soon. And probably this week, and they're going to start doing a thousand tests a week. Then we're going to have serological testing. So I think, you know, it's just a matter of time before we have a really more robust testing capabilities in this country that I think are going to change things dramatically. 
Are hospitals in Georgia coordinating resources and case management to help improve outcomes? There's a lot of coordination happening across hospitals, and I think it's happening more coordination than we've ever seen. And I've heard actually, even here in Metro Atlanta, hospitals, uh, CEOs, I, I heard were talking to each other and saying, you know, this is not the time to compete against each other like we normally do. This is the time to, to work together and to do it effectively, and they're doing that. I don't know how much coordination is happening. I'm not in those meetings, but I know they're at least having meetings and they're talking to each other, and that's a huge change from wherever we've been before. Regarding medical students, do you think we can return to clerkships if we have not had the virus, or should recovered only students return? Good question, right? I don't know the answer to that. Clearly, recovered students can come back. Maybe the students that are that are uh, that have not uh, had the disease need to continue. You know, will be able to come, but then we'll have to wear a mask. Right now, in the hospital, everybody's wearing a mask. We have a universal masking policy here at Grady. And it is, again, about, about protecting ourselves and protecting others from, from the disease. What are the chances of needing hospital admission if you've already been having difficulty breathing and fever for over three weeks? I think you need to be evaluated. Okay. And I know a lot of people have talked about the difficulty in decision making in where to get evaluated. So if just an average person is saying, okay, this is me for three weeks, where do you recommend I go, Dr. Del Rio? What's your advice on that? Well, my advice is number one, use the coronavirus checker that Emory has developed, because that will tell you whether you need to be evaluated or not. And even by your zip code, tell you where to get evaluated by your, it may be an urgent care center near, near you. It may be your primary care physician. It may be an, an emergency room. I think it really depends. And I think it's going to depend what, you know, what availability you have to your primary care physician and our urgent care center and what availability you have. And maybe just even making a phone call. Mm -hmm. uh, given the unknowns, and I'll tell you, we've gotten this question a couple times during our live. Uh, how do you foresee sporting events being played within a stadium setting? And I know you were just talking about the fact that you love I, baseball. You I also know how much people miss it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be difficult. I'm not sure what the answer to that is going to be, right? Because uh, there's going to be chances of transmission. There's going to be the possibility of transmission. And I think uh, of if it right now is not the right thing to do, but maybe in the fall it will be. Uh, I think we all want to get back to sports. Sports are really important in our lives, are really important in our society. And the question is, how do we do it? How do we ensure that sports are safe? And I don't know the answer to that at this point in time. How long between exposure and being detected on a test? If I'm exposed on a Tuesday, would it show up in a test on Wednesday? It, it, it probably won't. It needs a couple of days, and we think that it's, the average is about five days. How do we know if we've already had it? Is there a test? We know there's a test. Does the virus stick with you? Uh, I'm assuming this person is asking if... No, it doesn't stick with you. The, the virus you know, goes away. Eventually, you clear it. Your immune system clears the virus. So there's How's... no chronic carriers of this disease. How soon could a treatment be pushed through FDA clinical trials if a drug is showing promising results? You know, if the drug is showing promising results, I think the FDA is going to be quickly trying to get that into, into the market very quickly. I think companies and the FDA are really, they're working extra hard to get things approved quickly. What are the turnover times with current testing? If it's three to four days, do we have a test that's able to provide results in a more rapid fashion? Uh, yes, we are increasingly having results that are tests that are giving you results very quickly. So uh, now a typical turnaround time is, is actually a couple hours. Why is Georgia a hot spot? How did this happen? Uh, well, you know, I think that several things happen. Uh, number one, Atlanta is an international city, right? This is an international virus. It travels everywhere. You know, we have, we have one of the good news is we have one of the busiest airports in the world. Bad news is we have one of the busiest airports in the world. You know, and, and in this interconnected world, this traveling respiratory viruses go places. And I think cities where you have big airports, a lot of influx of people are going to have the disease. And that's the case of New York and Atlanta and Chicago and other places. But there's also in Georgia, we also have learned the impact of gatherings, right? And the outbreak mm -hmm. in, in, in Albany, for example, linked to a funeral. There was one person, one infected person that went to a funeral and that caused a huge outbreak within that, those two funerals that occurred. Uh, I think that is a reminder again of the mayor of, of, uh, of Doherty County 
said in an interview something that I think is very important. You, we're all one person away, one infection away from having an outbreak. So when, when you have people going from, you know, somebody from New York or somebody from Atlanta could travel to a community, there's no cases, and that person take the infection there, and all of a sudden you have an explosion. So the, the, this virus moves and transmits very silently until you see a, a, you know, a, a cases, and that's why we have to practice social distancing. That's why it's very important that we don't have, gather in big groups right now, because you're not immune just because you don't have it. Another question, Dr. Del Rio, what is a chronic carrier? A chronic carrier is a person that has an infection and it doesn't go away. And typically you'll see an infection like hepatitis C or hepatitis B where you become a chronic carrier. HIV, you can say you become a chronic carrier. But, but in this virus, in coronavirus, you don't become a chronic carrier. Does the virus stay on clothing? Good question and the answer is probably not. After the 14-day isolation and the symptoms lessen, how long does the reoccurring symptoms last? That sounds like that's two questions put together. Well, again, if you have recurrent symptoms, you're not recovered. Recovery means you have no symptoms. I am missing my cancer treatments because I'm afraid to go to the hospital. I'm in the highest risk group. What should I do? I think you need to talk to your oncologist. If you need your treatments, there's, way to do it. there's ways to do it safely. I know here at Emory, the oncologists are working very hard to ensure that their patients continue getting their therapy that is necessary and, and do it in a safe way. Once you have it, are you immune like chickenpox? We think so. Why is the disease progression so different in different patient populations? Well, again, because that's what diseases do, right? Diseases have very different progression in different populations. In this disease, in general, younger people do better than older people. People without underlying diseases do better than people with, with chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cancer. So it, it, the, the, the progression, the spectrum of the disease depends on two things. Number one, we think how much virus you, you get. So if you have a big viral load, if you have a big contagious, contagious dose, you're more likely to have more severe disease. And number two, the host, the, the, the host, you know, a, a host that is immunocompromised, the host that is older is not going to do as well as a host that is younger and not immunocompromised. Any infectious disease is this battle between the pathogen and the host, right? And it's a mixture of those two things that leads to the outcome. Um, I, this is a question we've talked about it before, but it bears repeating, I guess. How do you clean produce that you buy and how long do you leave packages you bought untouched? You clean produce with, with soap and water. I mean, I think I would, I, I'm not seeing in my house anything different than we've always done as far as cleaning of produce is concerned. You cook them, you clean them, you, you put them in the refrigerator, you put them away in the pantry. Um, packages that you get, you know, I would say it depends. I mean, you get, let's say, let's get, let's say I took takeout the other day. So I get the package with the takeout. I get the stuff out of the, out of the foam, uh, styrofoam package. I put it in a plate in my house. I clean my hands. I take the package. I, you know, dispose of it. I put it in a plastic bag, dispose of it. Uh, close, you know, after I put all the packages in there, close that plastic bag, throw it away, and then I clean my hands. Period. That's all you need to do. Uh, this question makes me think of how much we're all missing each other right now of uh, being apart because this question is, can the virus be transferred via a pet spur? Can we pet other people's animals? Yes, we can. Okay, that's good to know. I have not been petting anyone's dogs. Um, does the virus live on fresh produce? I know this ties into what you just answered, but does it live there? You know, chances are it doesn't. Again, viruses need to live inside cells. They're just not sitting there. They, it would live in a protist if the protist had been contaminated with saliva from somebody. And, you know, again, I recommend that you wash your protist. All right. All right. Last few questions here. We've taken up a lot of your time. Is it safe to do outdoor physical activity with others, two others max, as long as physical distance is maintained? I think so. I mean, I think that's a good idea. Keep physical distance and make sure that the person exercising with you is also healthy. Everybody needs to be healthy, right? If somebody doesn't feel well, they should not be exercising with you. Our last question for you today, how long does it take someone to recover from this virus? Anecdotally, we're hearing from people here in Atlanta who have it, who say they feel quite terrible for weeks and weeks. And a lot of people are saying it's a month 
before they're normal again. Is that typical with this? And most people get better after about two weeks. Uh, it may take a little longer in some individuals, but most people are at the end of seven to two, four, to two weeks are doing fine. Seven days to two weeks are doing fine. The great majority. Now you have people that are very ill and end up in the hospital and they're in the hospital for three or four weeks. So it really, I mean, again, we talk about the spectrum of illness, but the great majority of people recover pretty quickly. Dr. Del Rio, here's, here's how I'd like to wrap this with you if you don't mind and humor me. The one thing I've heard from so many people that's difficult is the uncertainty of all of this. Not just the physical distance we're keeping from each other, but not knowing exactly how this is going to play out. Worrying that if it gets normal this summer, it's going to start all over again in the fall. So what is your best doctor, dad advice for all of us who are getting through this one day at a time? And a lot of people say that, you know, April so far feels like it's five years long. Well, you know, give us, first, give us your best all, pep talk. First of all, I tell people, let's erase April from our calendars. Because, I, again, I agree. The best thing we can do is erase April from our calendars. This is going to be a really tough month. Let's, let's also uh, keep in mind that this is going to end, but it's going to end. Uh, a lot of it depends on how much we do the right things. Each one of us contributes to doing the right thing so we can stop the transmission of the virus. The more we do our part, the more likely we are to get a good result. And then I would say, yes, uncertainty is, is horrible. I, I don't like it. Nobody does. We all love our lives that are structured. We know what to expect. We know what's going to happen. And right now we're living in a little bit of a, of a dream, right? Of something that we don't recognize. And, and it's a little bit of a nightmare and it's very hard. And I would say that we need to do a couple of things. Number one, we need to take care of each other. And uh, I think we're fortunate that this is happening at a time that we have uh, technology like this one that allows me to see you right now, that allows me to talk to you, that I almost feel like I'm talking to you in, in person as right. opposed to being you know, several miles away. I think that we need to connect with our families. We need to connect with our friends. We need to connect with each other. We need to do things that, 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 that give us joy in our lives. We need to remind of those little things that are enjoyable in life. We need to be sure that we don't forget that life is worth living and that we, we are, we're here for a reason and that we can work together and get this done and, and think about all the good things that have happened thus far. And, you know, life is full of, of joys and, and difficult times, joys and sorrows, and this is the course of life. And, uh, and you have to live through it and you have to really enjoy every minute of it. And even in the worst of times, there, there are moments of joy that we should embrace, we should uh, feel good about, and we should celebrate. So don't stop celebrating just because we're apart. Continue celebrating and continue enjoying life. A little glimpse into your life that I see on Twitter is you share at night pieces of classical music that you love. So I'm guessing that's one of the ways that you make yourself feel better. You know, for me, uh, yes, uh, listening to music is a way that I like to end my day. I, I also like reading a lot. I have not been able to do a lot of reading, honestly, because I'm exhausted. But I can, you know, sit down and close my eyes and listen to some music. And I think when I think about music, when I think about those beautiful things, art, uh, you know, sound. Uh, there's there's so much to be said. There's so much to be enjoyed in life, and and that if you're absolutely right. For me, I could not envision a world without music, and I could not envision a world in which I'm I'm hearing creativity and I'm hearing uh, just the the wonders that that the human spirit and the human mind are able to create. So yes, it may be for one for me, it may be music. For somebody else, it may be watching birds or seeing the flowers, and for other person, it may be you know. A painting or doing, but do something that brings joy to your life, that brings, brings peace to your life, and then more importantly, allows you to 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 not uh, reverberate and not continue thinking about about what if, what if, what if, because the what if is is really incredibly stressful and and anxiety provoking and is not leading to anything good. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, I feel like over the course of these several weeks where everyone's gotten a chance to bring their questions to you. I mean, obviously you're not only a pandemic expert, but uh, oftentimes I feel like you're a coach um, trying to help the team that is Georgia uh, get through this. So thank you. And I know that we will see you again soon. Thank you for all your hard work and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Thanks, we'll Dr. Be in touch. And again, uh, people need to ask questions because questions 
are important and we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Take care. Be well, take care. You too. All right, everyone. See you soon. Stay home. Stay healthy. Bye.